the amazing thing is that these chi I mean, chickens are are tropical fowl, right? They're 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 evolved from from uh, southeast southeast Asian uh, jungle fowl, and you'd think that they might be a little bit uh, sensitive to temperature, but they don't care. I've seen it at as low as zero in the chicken house, and they're just fine. Strange thing happened the other night, though. We we got home and uh, we had the rooster indoors because he. <clears throat> has been henpecked lately. He has been uh, being beat up by the hens. <coughs> so we had him indoors and uh, he's been getting better and he's filling out and feathers growing back and all that kind of stuff. And uh, yesterday, uh, two, three days ago, Lori fed him when we got home. Fifteen minutes later he was dead. Boom. I think it was an aneurysm. I think he had an aortal blowout and just dropped. <laughs> yeah, sometimes happens. It, so, I, I, if I had to make up a story, I think mean, the, 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 the sort of reproductive state varies with time of year in, in, in birds, right? Testosterone output goes down in the winter, goes up in the summer. And I'm guessing it's less aggressive in the, in the winter than in the summer. And we have some very aggressive ch uh, hens. They are ju just kick-ass hens. And I think the combination of that got him. But I think that the, the you know, sudden death was unrelated to that. We did not do an autopsy, however. Tempted, but not, didn't do it. Wow, pretty sparse today. So I wanted to talk a little bit more about the modeling we did last time. I think last time, this is the pacer circuit I, I, I put up. And <clears throat> I did one addition here, and that's to, to plot the, the, the current flow along with the voltage. So the, the voltage, these are, the traces are color coded by location here. So the, the voltage is the inside voltage of the cell <clears throat> pacing away at 3 hertz or so. And then the green trace is the current through this wire. And the blue trace is the current through this wire. So the green trace is something like <clears throat> Excuse me. Something like the sodium current. It's the fast transient depolarizing current, and the blue trace is the slow repolarizing current, potassium current. And what we see is that as the system depolarizes, there's a fast transient sodium current which carries which causes the depolarization, causes the, the voltage to increase here. And then a sharp spike in potassium current, which is correlated with the repolarization phase, with the recovery phase. There's also a sharp spike in sodium current associated with the repolarization phase. But there's no current in the center. Why do you think that is?
That's exactly right. At the top of the peak, this point has gone almost all the way to 5 volts. Since the driving force is 5 volts, no more current can flow. So the current stops here, essentially. The potassium current turns on and starts driving the voltage back down, at which time this conductance, which is still on, is, uh, is, be is uh, drawing more current. This is fairly non-physiological. In real, in real cells, the sodium current turns off and doesn't turn back on at the end of the, at the end of the, at, during the repolarization because it's been inactivated. So a separate process called sodium inactivation. So I decided I'd model up the sodium inactivation. As, as I talked briefly about last time. Now in this case, same simulation. <clears throat> Um, the auto scaling here is killing me, but so now the the voltage shape has changed somewhat because I've been fiddling. I fiddled with the sodium dynamics, but you can see that there's a now a sharp spike due to the sodium simulator and another sharp spike due to the, the repolarization of the potassium simulator. But there's n but the but the sodium current during the recovery phase is relatively small, and the reason is that next to the five volt battery, in series of the five volt battery, put a hundred k resistor, which is charging a three microfarad capacitor. So this has a time constant of something like a third of a second or so. This recharges between action potentials. <clears throat> but cannot recharge during an action potential. Once this is charged up, the system sits there until this transistor turns on, at which time there's almost no resistance here. The system just discharges through there and pounds the voltage up very quickly to a high voltage. Then the capacitor is discharged, it has to trickle charge, it can barely produce any more current, and so the sodium stays off. I think it's possible to do a better model. I just didn't have time to fiddle with it. I think adding another transistor can model that. <clears throat> but that's a kind of a first order model of sodium inactivation. Where you 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 discharge the 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 stored air, you discharge what's there and then no more can flow for a while. <coughs> It's not completely satisfactory because it changed not only the shape of the action potential, but the amplitude. It almost have the amplitude. So it needs, it, it needs work. I think I know how to fix it. I just like I said, I didn't have time to fix it. So That was really all I had to say about, about the modeling. I thought I might talk a little bit um, about uh, the retina since uh, one of the students uh, requested it. Of course, he's not here, but that's OK. So <clears throat> there is a phenomenal amount known about vision system, visual system. And the circuitry in the retina has been studied at least since 1900 by Santiago Ramoni Cajal, who drew, drew beautiful pictures of the cells. <clears throat> and the, the diagram is meant to represent uh, th sort of three layers of the retina. You have the photodetectors out here, which are actually on the inside of the eye. The light goes, light comes in from this side, and goes through this whole mess, hits these regions of the cell here, in which you have stacked layers of a photosensitive material that can transduce 
uh, photons into charge. There's two types of cells. There are cone cells, which are less sensitive, but respond specifically to wavelength. So you have red cones, green cones, and blue cones. And there's rods, which um, are broadband, respond to any photon, although they tend to like <coughs> shorter wavelengths better, more blue light better. And the rods are sensitive enough to be photon limited. Under certain circumstances, if you're completely dark adapted, you can see one photon, which is amazing. You are, you are as good a detector as can be. Actually, your, your rods have about a 10% photon efficiency. So on average, you have to see, you have to be hit by 10 photons to see one, but, but, you, but each event is, each rod event is just one photon. <clears throat> That's pretty amazing. And this is, and, and the system is not that quiet. There's all kinds of, of biological noise in here, as well as random thermal activation of the system. So filtering out that one photon noise is, is pretty amazing. <clears throat> there's, a, there's a small charge change which causes these terminals to hyperpolarize, to become slightly less, uh, become more negative. <clears throat> then there is, there are two other major layers in, in, in the retina which are related to signal processing of the raw output. And the signal processing of the output is aimed at at least three things. One is dynamic range expansion, trying to get a sensitivity over a large range of intensities, and therefore automatic gain control, doing AGC. Contrast enhancement in space and contrast enhancement in time. In other words, looking for changes, sensitivity to changes in both space and time. <clears throat> some of the some of the gain control is done at the very front end by the by the by the receptors which under bright light conditions will bleach so to speak some of the some of the of the uh, uh, photochemical material gets used up and so they become less sensitive And that accounts for something like three orders of magnitude of sensitivity uh, of gain control, but you're good over something like six decades of light. So, so there has to be more to it than that. As with all biology, there's a huge amount of nomenclature here. This is the outer nuclear layer. This co corresponds to the to the to the receptor cells. And then there is the inner nuclear layer, in which there are several different kinds of, thank you, cells. I guess I better hit this once in a while. There's horizontal cells, which connect together across, across uh, receptors. So you might guess they have something to do with spatial processing. There's bipolar cells, so-called because they have two uh, processes coming out of them. One, synaptic input from a, a range of, of uh, sensors, and then going down into the inner plexiform layer. This is the outer plexiform layer. Plexiform means, I guess, uh, connections, lots of connections. And not all of the 
all of the B's are supposed to be bipolars, but they didn't draw all the connections because it would have been incomprehensible. Then there are amacrine cells, which connect somehow to bipolar cells and then travel a long distance horizontally in the inner plexiform layer and propagate action potentials. So they fire action potentials which propagate a long distance this direction horizontally and, and probably have something to do with a nonlinear gain control because now we have a very nonlinear process which is producing action potentials. Uh, which is also capable now of, of propagating a long distance along this direction. Then the the inner layer is the is the ganglion cell layer, and this is the output to the to the optic nerve. This gets connected to the brain through a bunch of wave stations. <clears throat> and does it seem odd that that the light would have to go through all this gunk to get up there to the to the receptors? Yeah. Why is it why why would you build it that way? Hmm. Any any thoughts? Yeah, lights coming from the bottom goes through all these layers of cells and then hits the receptors. This has an inner wall of the yeah. Now, <clears throat> now, there's another aspect to that, too, and that is that because the inner layer here originates the optic nerve, then the optic nerve has to go out through the wall. It has to go back through the receptor sheet, which means there's a hole in the receptor sheet. Your blind spot where the, where the optic nerve exits. So there's kind of two obscurities there. Why would you do that? I'm not sure I know. It's possible, I suppose, that the back wall of your eye is, is somewhat reflective. And if you press the receptors against it, then the light that comes back off that wall at least doesn't confuse the image. And in some eyes, we don't have them, but dogs, cats, get a, f a factor of two gain by, re by having reflectors in the back of their eye. So I, you, I'm sure you've all shined a light into a dog eye and it come, glows green at you. Um, so they get, they get a 6 dB gain because of that, and uh, that only works if the receptors are pretty close to the reflective surface because otherwise the light will scatter off the reflective surface and, and diffuse the image. <clears throat> so, I guess I should have set the time up here, but mostly I just have to keep track of it. The uh, this is uh, from a, a, a site called Retina Anatomy UPenn Edu. The uh, uh, they claim that um, that there are. Now, we start talking about processing here. There's processing at all levels. There's, there's some evidence that rods and cones are coupled together electrically so, so that they can affect each other, other's gain, particularly at crossover intensities. So in bright light, you're, you're cone-dominated. 
in very dim light, your rod dominated cones don't work. But in the crossover region, there's some evidence that electrical coupling between the cells <clears throat> allows kind of a co-processing that smooths the transition from one to the other. In the outer plexiform layer, there's a there's a spatial low pass filter which is constructed by electrical connections between cones so that act activation of one cone tends to spread over several cones or at least neighbors and you'd think that would reduce resolution which it does because the light activation function is now diffused a little bit. But if you, if you choose that coupling correctly, it anti-aliases. That says that a light which is smaller than a single cone, a light dot smaller than a single cone, will activate a region which is wider than a cone so let's say we have a, a very narrow light like this. If we were to scan it across this cone and then to the next cone, when the light was falling in here, you didn't see it. Or you might be dimmer. Gets on here, you see it again. If you cause diffusion from cone to cone, at least that way you get some smoothing across the system. So there's a spatial low pass filter from lateral electrical connections and a high pass filter corresponding to horizontal cells. So the horizontal cells look at all of these outputs and they kind of estimate the average. So they're taking an average of the local intensity, <clears throat> which is then used as a reference to subtract off from the activity so it gives you a high pass it's a temporal high pass it says that um, uh, what matters is deviation from the mean you don't care about averages averages are boring averages are static averages won't kill you fast moving stuff is what's dangerous or interesting yeah Well, there must be some scattering. Yeah, there has to be some scattering. And, uh... So I'm wondering if that scattering has something to do with why the photo receptor is in place back there. It's so it probably does some anti-aliasing also. Uh, on the other hand, if all this stuff is basically water, then the index of refraction of the individual cells is not too much different and so you don't get too much scattering and I've never looked at a retina under a microscope but I've looked at thin films of cells in dishes and uh, under unstru with unstructured light you basically can't see them because the index of refraction is so close to water you have to do something that amplifies the index change the, the small index changes to, to see them at all. The so-called so phase contrast or, or, or some sort of enhanced contrast microscope. So I suspect that even though all this gunk is in the way, it's not so important because it's almost transparent. So then, and there's quite a bit of controversy over how you actually do get single photon sensitivity. And the guess is that it's based on a strong threshold in the cells that connect to rods, so-called RB cells, which have a strong threshold and probably also have a high synaptic gain. 
So they produce a lot of chemical transmitter on a f with a fairly small change in, in voltage. And that combined with the cell nonlinearity gives you good sensitivity, but that also means that you're sacrificing dynamic range because the threshold has to be very carefully set to catch the photon but ignore the noise. So probably that threshold is dynamic. There's going to have to be a gain setting stage in there that, that varies the, the, the threshold dynamically with the background light. So, it looks like, this is so, so complicated, it looks like there's more gain control at the bipolar stage, particularly where uh, bipolar cells interact with amacrine cells, which are doing some sort of, uh, again, sort of nonlinear decision making. And They're probably, they're probably acting to shut down the response uh, because the high sodium currents here are going to act like uh, current shunts. They're going to act like, they're going to act to turn off synaptic, synaptic activity, although I don't know that that's well defined yet. So then at the next level, start getting The ganglion cells show more coherent, uh, what you might call receptive fields or, or more structured fields in the sense that they will show direct direction sensitivity. If you move, so the receptive field of a ganglion cell might have a bunch of, of receptors in it. So one ganglion cell is going to be looking at a whole bunch of receptors. It's going to be connected to a whole bunch of receptors. And if a stimulus dot goes across the receptor field this way, the ganglion cell will produce a response. If it goes across this way, it will not. If the spot is in other cells, there will be an optimum size spot so that you'll have so that a spot that's small will be more stimulatory than a spot that's big and diffuse. As if there's a connection with positive weights from the center and negative weights around the edge. Looks like a Gabor wavelet. You know what a Gabor wavelet looks like? Like this. looks like a uh, sine x over x. It's an approximation of sine x over x. So it looks, it, it's, it's, a, it's an arrangement that responds well to edges through here or points, but responds poorly to average light. Again, suggesting that average intensities don't matter too much to your visual system. What matters is differences across a field. <clears throat> there is also, there are cells that respond strongly when a dot is turned off and, and when a dot is turned on. So they'll notice time transients as well as space transients. So there's, so there's a the system is taking a first derivative in time, it's looking for changes in time, it's looking for changes in space. There are also uh, um, ganglion cells which encode color differential. After all, you, act, you have four channels here. You have red, green, blue, and rod. And the, there are cells that look for 
color edges. Red, green, blue, red, green, blue, looking for color edges, intensity edges, as well as uh, our color, color edges as well as intensity edges. So all that stuff then is processed into the in the in the retina before it ever gets before it ever gets to the optic nerve. I think this thing is training me to touch the screen at intervals. It's probably a uh, you know it's a form of machine intelligence taking over. Um, is there more to this at the bottom? Yeah. The optic nerve. So then these cells are going to go off to the optic nerve, which then, um, let me see, what's the next step? Processing thalamus, I think. It is a huge job to figure out how this piece of the retina works. One of the things that's being done in, uh, in electrical engineering here is to try and spread a retina out on an electrode array in Molnar's lab. So you build an electrode array with a few hundred field effect transistors in a grid. Then you, you take the retina out of some animal lay it flat onto the electrode array in the dark, then shine light patterns on it in the dish, and watch the potentials that come out of the field effect transistors. In principle, you should be able to figure out how the system works. Uh, it's a huge data analysis problem. So you figure, if you had a thousand electrodes, so a 30 by 30 array, 1,000 electrodes, all recording at 10 kilohertz, is uh, um, 10 to the 7th samples a second, right? 10 to the 7th samples a second. And you want to run this for maybe a retinal, maybe last three hours. Oh, man. So now we're looking at at uh, 10 to the fourth seconds for the for the experiment so now you're looking at 10 to the 11th uh, samples which are sparsely represented by all right, I mean most of the samples are going to be zeros there's going to be some spikes and some other information in there they're going to be related in in extremely complicated ways what do you do then what kind of what kind of patterns should you look for? Well, clearly there's you can you can start to think about cause and effect. Certainly, events that come later can't have caused events that come earlier. But the patterns that come out of a, an electrode array like that are so complicated that it's a major computational undertaking to figure out what happened from one experiment. And then, of course, you do that every day. For a few hours a day. Any thoughts on this, by the way, on, on how to handle this kind of data? Um, no, we, we did it with the olfactory phones. There was a similar thing. Uh, and yeah, you do it every day, you cut up a rat. Take out the, my, and you're recording from mitral cells or from the, from the, right from the, right from where the pr primary olfactory yeah. nerve comes in, yeah. And you get this pile of data. Yeah, you Right. Somehow, somehow you have you have real meaningful data going from one center to another within within the network, and figuring out what constitutes a meaningful data unit is even hard. <clears throat> even doing elementary things like saying, "Is this spike train 
similar to that spike trade or not? Uh oh. Well, what do you mean exactly? Because what matters is similarity here. What matters in terms of similarity is what does the animal do with the spikes? And so you need some sort of receiver function estimate to decide whether to decide whether these two spike trains are even similar or not, let alone how they're related to one another. What's often been done, what's been done for decades, if not centuries, is to look at a long spike train, spike train, and just arbitrarily bin it into, say, 0.1 second bins. And that's a really bad idea because the bin edges have nothing to do with the spikes and nonlinearly make a decision about where a spike is. And once it's in the bin, it's just in the bin. You don't know where it is in the bin. Right? So it just becomes, it becomes uh, anonymous inside the bin. And that's a, that is a, uh, a loss of information that is irretrievable and probably doesn't make any sense. And if you have a fairly few number of spikes in a bin, oh, well, let's say that the bin edge had been here rather than here. That changes the statistics. It puts the, bin in, it puts the spike in this bin rather than this bin. Uh, it's really hard to figure out what happened. So what you really want are binless methods of analyzing spike trains that represent the spike trains in a way which is similar to how the brain represents them, whatever that is. So you're kind of bootstrapping your way into this. You say, well, time probably matters. Let's come up with a model of how time matters. And now we know how to analyze spikes because we know how individual spikes matter in the system. Oh, well, that doesn't make any sense. Now let's modify our, our method for we have to come up with a better estimate of what the spikes do before we can decide how to how to separate them. It's a it's a bootstrap problem and it's very hard. So you could move a spike. Yeah, and your cost, the increase of the cost depended on how much you had to move it. So the, okay. And you could also insert spikes. That would really so, the cost. so, so then, and the other, the other thing you could do is say, one way to make these two trains more similar is to insert a spike here. O or you could take this spike and move it over here and move this one to here. And and you try and make them. <clears throat> and this is uh, by uh, what's his name? Is uh, it is it uh, is it Weil, isn't he? What's it? John Victor? Yeah. And this is a nice scheme because it it says th and and you get to choose. You always say that it, taking a spike out or putting it in has a value of one. Moving a spike is proportional to how much you move it compared to some time. So it's a fraction that's always less than one. It always has a value less than one because if it was more than one you just insert a spike or delete a spike. But if you want to move it a little bit, what you mean by a little bit depends on some time which corresponds probably to the time constant of the receiver the integration time of the receiver. You have some membrane time constant in the receiver, which is adding spikes up. <clears throat> and so John Victor's method introduces at least a, a low order estimate of the processing by saying the time of the receiver, the, the time constant of the receiver matters. It is binless. What's amazing is you look at this, you say, that's horrible. That's got to be an n-squared problem, right? 
that's got to be n squared. You, you, oh, I could do so many different things in a spike train. How could I possibly figure out what is the easiest thing to do? It's got to be n squared. It isn't. It's order n in number of spikes. And that was proven. This is, this is so, this is so demoralizing. It was proven by a high school student working in his lab who also wrote the MATLAB code to implement the method. Dimitri something, I forget his last name. And you say, oh, what was I doing in high school? It makes me feel really inadequate. But, you know, it's, a, it's an interesting process. So, the next step then, what's been done, so up to this point, we've done very low level stuff. We've extracted averages, found edges, or found tentative points of light, maybe extracted directions of motion of points, uh, but there's no real concept of an edge or a shape or a binocular vision or depth or anything involving two eyes. There's only the, the very lowest levels of, of processing. Interestingly, <clears throat> there's some evidence that people who are genetically, uh, naturally, genetically deficient in the proteins necessary to make rods and cones can still see light. Not very sensitive, not, not, no, no real resolution. They can see maybe, maybe blobs of light and dark. And it may come in from direct stimulation of the ganglion cells. They may be slightly light sensitive. Do you, have you ever heard of optogenetics? Optogenetics is, pardon me? Yes. Ge well, it turns out that there are genes that, are, yeah, you can do this too, but in this case, you're using genetics to insert genes that make neurons light sensitive. So you take a protein from a, a, a bacteria that's light sensitive. You, tra you, you insert the gene into a mouse brain and you can cause it to be specifically expressed in certain classes of cells. And then those cells become sensitive to light. And I'll see if I can get it right. If you fire blue light, and there's actually at least two different proteins known, one of which opens depolarizing sodium light channels one that opens chloride-like hyperpolarizing channels. And I think the, the, blue, the, the blue protein opens depolarizing channels and the yellow protein opens hyperpolarizing inhibiting channels. So you can express these in a brain, then you can shine light into the brain and manipulate the cells, manipulate the activity of the cells with no electrical connection. So you can stick a fiber optic into the br mouse brain, shine yellow light or blue light in there, and modify the activity of the system. And if you've expressed the protein in a small region, you exp only affect that region of the brain. That's pretty cool. Would it be ethically appropriate to transfect a human retina with that if in the case of, say, macular degeneration, where the rods and cones are dying. If you could do that, if you could transfect the, the ganglion cells, maybe you could make them pretty sensitive to light. Maybe you could restore something like vision that way. Is it ethically feasible to do that, though? In Europe. In Europe. <laughs> well, I, it's an interesting question, and, and, I, and I don't know. I mean, that's a, that, uh, there's a lot of people who will debate that, I'm sure, and probably not too far in the future. Um, 
I don't know that any optogenetic material has ever been tried in a human. And I, I think that it would be wrong to do it at this point. But uh, it certainly is a, a powerful research tool. And um, used for all manner of things. That's what my son does right now. He's, he's an optogeneticist working on uh, control of feeding behavior and hunger, trying to understand how the forebrain and uh, um, parts of the brain that control feeding directly uh, uh, interact with obvious implications for human health feeding control, obesity, so on. So, I'm not sure how much more to do on vision. It looks like, it looks like I'm, I'm guessing from the cross-section of people here that the enthusiasm for lectures is, is decreasing. So, I'm going to say that we're done as of today and next week we will meet in the lab that means video note is done thank you and uh, so um, yeah I think it's time is any comments on final projects anybody want to talk about final projects Want to talk more about visual system? If you, if you, have you Googled up visual system? See what, oh, it's like drinking from the fire hose. There is an interesting site though, uh, Scholarpedia. It's like Wikipedia done right. Good sources? Yeah. Scholar. Scholarpedia. Scholarpedia. It's mostly computational neuroscience, but it's uh, <clears throat> seizure detection, Lyapunov coefficient. Oh, it doesn't get any better than that. Uh, recurrent neural networks. Benefits of recess in primary school. Okay. Homeostatic. Recess. Interesting. <clears throat> Lyapunov coefficient is a measure of chaos. chaos. And certainly some of these systems are, are chaotic. This is a good source of information. Let's see if I can find something that um, is more specifically uh, dynamic systems, computational neuroscience. Edited by uh, Eugene Izykovich, who is a, a very well-known computational neuroscience scientist at, at Salk. Um, experimental neuroscience, memory conditioning, vision! Theoretical neuroscience, dynamic systems, computational intelligence, good stuff. Let's, let's hit the vision link, see what they come up with here. Flash suppression. Flash suppression. I suppose that's something, not something you put on the front of a rifle. Um, Let's see what they have to say about retina here, since we just talked about that. <clears throat> it actually looks remarkably like the Wikipedia site. That's depressing. It looks like the same image. But again, here's a sort of a the image of the of the ganglion cells with the light coming through them, the the bipolar and amacrine cells, and then the photoreceptors over here. 
with all this gunk in the way? And do they come up with an explanation of why? No. So there's lots of good information here. Cellular and synaptic organization, light responses and retinal processing of information. Oh, nice. <clears throat> So it talks a little bit about how the how a spot is is processed into a response at the ganglion cell, and a little bit about transients. So this looks like an on like an off response. This looks like an on response. So there's there's processing for for time dependency as well as, as spatial dependency. A lot of nice information here, written in a style which is more, more oriented towards uh, scientists than, than the general public like Wikipedia is. So this is, this is pretty nice. Yeah, speaking of, and then, I, as we talked about before, combinations of, of uh, center surround cells where one ganglion cell has, a, has, a, has lots of receptors in its field and has a pattern which is related to contrast enhancement. So Where does it say answer out? Uh, so, so stimulus. Oh, yeah, yeah. so if you if you put a if you put a if you put a dot in the center, you get this. Sure. If you put a dot on the surround, you get a suppression. If you put a if you put it on the over the whole thing, oh, okay. you get almost you get a little bit of response. Okay. So it's sort of weakly stimulating. In the case of uh, in this off center, so you get all, you get some weak weak offness but not as strong and off. There's a rebound here. After the stimulus ends you get a burst at the end of it corresponding to some sort of recovery from from stimulation. <clears throat> I should have brought I, I I used a microcontroller to simulate this once upon a time. Uh, I built a, a, a retina with with four receptors and modeled a uh, modeled a uh, lateral inhibition system so that you got uh, a, any stationary light source over the top of the retina gave no response and if it was diffusely illuminated, illuminated it gave no response but if you moved the light source back and forth you got strong responses I should have brought that up. I'll bring that into the lab next week um, I used it in a, la in a lab once upon a time to train people how to look at uh, extracellular recording, where you have a nerve, you hook on a nerve with a pair of electrodes, and you shine light on the, on the retina, and you get a thousand different units firing. What do you do then? You have to, you have to separate them somehow. So this is kind of training for this, but in this case, there was only four units. There were four action potentials being fired. And you could make it harder and easier in the model. You could make them all the same amplitude, and then it was really hard. You could make them all different amplitude, and then it was easy. The, the, the general problem I'm having with, I mean, there's a, you had a request for, for talking about vision, hearing, and, 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 uh, and, uh, uh, prosthesis, that all of those are such huge subjects, I don't know where to start. You know, they're, 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 each one of them could use the last month of class. And so my inclination is to, to punt 
and say that we really need to get into the lab and work more in the lab. So, um, so that's what we're going to do next week. We'll go directly to the lab. And uh, uh, on Thursdays, we'll just be there from 11.30 to 4.30. And uh, on Tuesday, be there from 11.30 to 1.30 or so. Or I will be anyway. And uh, can use it as, as a way of, of getting specific information about final projects. <clears throat> I did look up a ah, nice. That's why I put it through here so I didn't tear the connector off of the off of the uh, So the the 5030 page has a not very well defined uh, set of reports from uh, not very obvious set of reports from from uh, the last time I taught it, which was 2009. And there are some interesting topics here. Uh, let me so we can talk a little bit about prosthesis. Just flipping through some of the slides here. Um, so these are just PowerPoint from from the from the students. Captain Hook, that being a primitive prosthesis, and um, some of the uh, some of the devices are getting fairly complicated uh, with either motors. Motors are heavy. Motors are hard to put on arms. Uh, what some people use are these things called uh, uh, inflatable muscles or McKibben muscles that are, are air bladders. They're air motors. They work like muscles. They're a bladder that swells up or, de or, or, or deflates, and it swells up and pulls your arm up. Makes a little noise. It's much lighter. You know, that kind of thing. But uh, the downside is you have to have a compressor. So the stuff that's on the arm is lighter, but the stuff that's in the, in the, uh, in the, that you carry around behind your back is not. And uh, um, so the, the, the main thing this guy was interested in was, was electrodes and um, how, you, how you got them. And in, the case, in this case, they were using <coughs> electrodes that were on the was arm prosthesis. And they were using electrodes which were on whatever was left of the arm. So if there was a piece of the arm that, that was this long, they were sticking electrodes onto the surface of the arm, the piece that was left. And um, it's pretty hard to make this work for the following reasons. But it could be done. Uh, sampling uh, with a, a ring of, of uh, electrodes and, oh, that's a duplicate, nice. And uh, by then, by using a classifier, they could, uh, they could get some, let's see if they have any pictures of this in action. He has any pictures? No, I don't think so. Let's go back to the, the next one then. Upper body myoelectric powered prosthesis. Yeah, the unpowered solution, the old style. You have a, a lever that's pressed by your upper arm that opens and closes the hook. And this is a powered solution which, with servo motors here and a, and a fairly large brace against the shoulder. Um, The, the, the question is, how do, you, how do you get the data? And 
So all this stuff, you can, you can guess what, what's going to have to happen here. It's just about the same as what you did with EMG. The, the trick here is how do, you do the, how do you do the front end acquisition? And um, the, these guys were <laughs> using electrodes all over the arm to play Guitar Hero. That's, that's pretty bizarre. Um, <clears throat> if an arm has been taken off up here, if you've lost your arm above the elbow, all you have left is a stump of nerve and a few muscles. As you know, recording from muscles is quite feasible, but if you then say to the person that has the arm, okay, all you've got to do is twitch the muscles that are left, and the, and the electrodes over the muscles will, will capture those signals and then move your arm. And so in the person who is learning this, you have to say, all right, I'm going to flex my shoulder, and that's going to make my thumb twitch. And it's a hard thing to learn. It requires a complete remapping of how you, how you understand things. If you could record from the nerve directly, the nerve that used to go down the arm, and you could identify the correct fibers, you could say, think about moving your thumb, those fibers will conduct an impulse, and we'll wire that up to the motor that moves the thumb. And that's not feasible because the nerve is too small. And, and the method is too invasive. You can't routinely rec record from a nerve. So what's been done is to take that nerve, resect it back, dissect it back, move it over to the chest, cut the nerve that normally runs the pectoralis muscle, lay, spread the nerve out, dissect it back a little bit, spread it out, and let it grow into the pectoralis muscle. After a couple of months, then when you think about moving your thumb, a little piece of your pectoralis muscle twitches. And you think about moving your little finger and another little piece twitches. And you think about moving your elbow and a big piece twitches. So then you go, and it's pretty stable. Once it grows back, it stays there. All right? So then you, then you tattoo dots on the skin corresponding to where all of the appropriate electrodes should be attached. And the person can get up in the morning and attach the electrodes to the standard positions and put the arm on. And when they think about th moving their thumb, the appropriate muscle twitches, the muscles picked up by the EMG amplifier, which then runs the servo motor to run the thumb. And I've seen some video of this. And, and the, the, the effect is, is fantastic. If you, with the old style where you have <clears throat> a fairly arbitrary mapping from muscles to, 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 uh, to motors, you see the person and they're sort of going like this and, and you see the arm go like this and then down and then rotate and then pick up and then lift. And then the person who has the more intuitive interface, after a, a week they go and pick it up. It just works. And you saw the, the actual video I saw was of, of a guy uh, using a drinking bottle, grabs the drinking bottle off the table and takes a drink. And it's smooth and fluid action, right? Because that's a fairly easy thing to retrain your brain to do. So now you're using the person's own muscle to stabilize the geometry of the nerve and to act as an amplifier so that your fairly insensitive electrodes can pick up the 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 signal. Ah, good good question. So <clears throat> the same nerve that runs down here, the ulna nerve, has sensory fibers. Right? If you could get those to grow in, you could you could do this strange thing where you you'd um, you'd have a, a, a force sensor on the fingertip that would run something buzzing against your chest, a vibrator or, or a piezo unit against your uh, chest. And that's been done also, so that you have very natural feedback. When you, touch, when you push on something with one of these switch sensors, it feels like you're touching it with your finger. 
And that's pretty cool. Because now, now you can pick up eggs and stuff. Pick up breakable stuff. Not just water bottles, but <clears throat> precision. Does that only work for pressure? Can you, can you put something hot on your chest? And it would it depend on the type of nerve? It does. Yeah, yeah. Uh, nerves are labeled lines, right? So, so you have in your skin, you have a, a variety of different sensors, all of which are on a labeled line. What do I mean by labeled line? If you get punched in the eye, you see light, right? You see flashes of light because the cells that are being stimulated are, even though it's pressure that, I mean, it hurts also, but but the pressure, pressure stimulates the, the, the photoreceptors, and the photoreceptors are wired to a piece of your brain that sees light. So you see light. Uh, if you stimulate a receptor that, if you use any method to stimulate, stimulate a receptor that feels temperature, that's wired to, to a temperature center, you'll feel temperature. So you have to get the right nerve endings hooked up not all of them will hook up. I doubt if pain receptors work very well. I doubt if you're going to be able to to put your hand in the fire and say, ow, and pull it back. You know, just, but, uh, but, but, but pressure does work, or, or se uh, pressure sense does work. <clears throat> and I wouldn't be surprised if temperature does also. But I don't know. This does require nerve regrowth and I'm not sure the conditions under which this occurs I mean, typically peripheral nerves regrow and if there's no barrier to regrowth like scar tissue you'll get regeneration down a limb things won't be wired up quite the same way they used to be but they will wire up and I think it's on the order of a millimeter a day growth something like that. So it can take a while. The only direct experience with this I have is um, um, I had Bell's palsy once where half of your face is paralyzed because your facial, the facial nerve, where, the, for your, where your facial nerve comes through your skull is a tight fit. And if you get a viral infection of the nerve, then the nerve swells and it cuts off support to the nerve and parts of the nerve die. And parts of it, and, and it all becomes non-functional for a while. So the right side of my face was completely paralyzed for four weeks. And it's pretty inconvenient because you can't talk. So the mouth is always open, right? So. And I was, I, was, I was speaking in public at the time, so I'd have to hold this side of my mouth closed so I didn't slur. So I'd apologize in advance and say, this is why I'm holding the side of my mouth closed. I couldn't close my right eye. I had to tape it closed at night. You know, the, I, didn't, I didn't produce, the lacrimal muscles were all paralyzed. I couldn't tear. I couldn't make tears. I had to lubricate my eye with... Uh, with uh, artificial tear stuff because the, the, everything is paralyzed. Tongue is not paralyzed. Jaw muscles are not paralyzed. That's a different nerve. Let's see, tongue is hypoglossal, right? Facial, I don't remember what the jaw muscles come off of. But uh, taste was a little bit affected. Things didn't taste right on one side of my mouth. A little bit metallic kind of taste, but not bad. But it's, it's really bizarre not to be able to move. You smile, one side smiles, the other side hangs there, right? People take a step back. It's, it's frightening. Yeah, that's all right. I mean, that, that's, 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 you know, all the mucus producing stuff was working just fine, but none of the contractile muscles in the face. So, when, I, when the nerves finally reconnected, I, if I smiled, my, my eye would blink. So some, some nerve endings got mixed up there. And it took, I don't know, a few months to unlearn that, to relearn it. So the connections were correct. 
Yeah, experiments you do on yourself, you know. You've got to be careful. Um, <clears throat> I also, I frostbit my big toes once, and it took, uh, so I, I did tests after that to see how long it took for the nerves to grow back in. And it took quite a while, it took a few weeks to get feeling back in my big toes. But the Bell's palsy was really weird. Avoid that if you can. So let's wrap it up. Clearly, enthusiasm for lectures is dropping. So we'll just go to the lab and see you there starting on Tuesday. Well, I'll be there this afternoon. <laughs>